So warm welcome to everybody who's joining us here today uh, for our Capital Insider series. We're looking forward to having a wonderful chat with Greg Sands, who is the managing director and managing partner for Costa Noa Ventures and is doing some great early stage investing in particularly in the tech space, in uh, the tech startups. And uh, he's joined us from Bay Area. So thank you very much for that, Greg. I know it's very late for you out there, but uh, thank you for being here and talking with us uh, about what the scene looks like. You know, for us here in India and Asia, we've always looked at the Silicon Valley for a um, great amount of inspiration when it comes to doing the startup and it really comes to understanding what the trends are like uh, in terms of new startups. So for, we're going to discuss in the next 45 minutes about what you really feel is something that the world today needs to know in terms of understanding the business models. Understandably out here in India and Asia, the whole digitization wave is very large and building a business for digital uh, is really the way forward, whether it's a consumer business or a manufacturing business, everybody needs to be in some ways uh, thinking digital and digitization of their platforms. So today, particularly, we would love for you to tell us as to what kind of trends do you see happening. Now, if I look at uh, the Costa Noa uh, portfolio, I see that there are a lot of companies you have in deep tech, whether it's data, whether it's fintech, uh, you know, or even uh, I would say all kind of related categories to uh, deep tech, AI. Um, so we would love for you to say that, tell us as to how do you see these trends changing today? What, what has changed post the pandemic for you in terms of how you're looking at startups? What kind of startups are you looking at? Is there something that has changed substantially for you in terms of how uh, or what kind of startups you want to invest in? Or probably the, you feel that uh, in that scenario, probably things continue to be the same. In India, we have seen, you know, particularly when the whole uh, business environment has been very subdued. We've seen geo platforms in India, which has raised huge amount of funding uh, today. And, you know, with everybody like from Facebook to Google, everybody is investing over here in India on geo platforms. So there is huge deep tech opportunity today for technologies to be developed indigenously. And do you see, uh, therefore, markets in India or Asia becoming more important to you for doing future investments? So I'm going yeah, to give it to you. I'd love to hear you. Yeah, so there's a, there's a lot to take on, but I'd say the it is interesting to note the huge investments in geo, and I think it is uh, exciting to see the you know the sustained economic development in India creating uh, not only a deep middle class but also technology platforms that are important distribution vehicles for global companies. The company of ours that has been most active in doing that is a company called Amplify, Amplify AI. You can think of it as a, uh, it is a uh, business consumer engagement tool that helps companies make uh, effectively chatbots that engage with consumers over Facebook Messenger, text, you know, Google RCS and the like. Uh, and it has, had, it has been very active in India, it has both a uh, sales effort and much of its product development in India as well. Sure. And I mean, particularly from a, uh, you know, from a deep tech perspective, what kind of startups are you looking at today? What kind of new trends are you seeing happening today? I mean, has healthcare been one sector in, or health tech, I would say one sector that you've started looking at post or amidst the pandemic? No, not, not really. I'd say, you know, the, um, we do some things or uh, call it, you know, software that supports the, the healthcare ecosystem and even the edge of software and fintech to, that supports the billing around healthcare. But we, g g given our expertise and what we do, we're actually been more focused on things like uh, the data science and machine learning infrastructure. Sure. And so about half of our last six investments over the last nine months have been in data science and machine learning infrastructure because right. we think that trend, I'll call it the Cambrian explosion of machine learning and its set of capabilities, both creates needs to develop the tools and platforms to uh, build and manage that set of capabilities. Right. And then there are a set of really interesting opportunities that are what we think of as applied artificial intelligence right. in specific business sectors or for a specific business function. 
Sure. And you said uh, data science and machine learning, and I mean, you're making very early stage investments in them. How do you see them growing in the coming years? I mean, do you see them becoming like faster unicorns than let's say an e-commerce company became back in 2010? So uh, in terms of their growth and their scale up, what, what are you seeing differently versus what happened in 2010? Well, I think the, uh, again, we, we don't particularly do e-commerce. E and so uh, every, each of these businesses has their own characteristics. I will say to me, the thing that I'll note is that if you go back a hundred years, hmm. people were starting telephone businesses. Right. But in 1970, it was ridiculous to call anything a telephone business. Right in 19, when I, I was at Netscape, in you know basically during the formative period and the initial launch of the uh, uh, you know, of all these internet businesses, you launch a business in 2010, let alone 2020, and it's silly to call it an internet business. Right. Because if you're in business, it's an internet business, and I think fundamentally that's going to be true for every substantial company, every growth company, every mid-market enterprise company is going to be an AI driven company. It's going to be a data driven company. It's going to be a machine learning driven company. So these technologies and these tools are, three years ago, they were very rudimentary. Sure. And therefore the needs weren't that fully developed. And what we're seeing is as people take these models and they push them into production and they need to manage their performance and optimize them and evolve them as the data involves and push them into production and retire them and keep a snapshot of a version of the model and a version of the data, there's just infinite complexity. And those are the kinds of problems that were, uh, that's, one, that's one of the big areas of emphasis. Sure, and do you see globalization of uh, companies in data science and uh, machine learning happening much faster than companies in other, you know, as I mentioned, maybe um, let's say other sectors or other kind of technologies? I think that the wave of globalization is, you know, continues to, to happen at an extraordinary pace. And I, I don't know that this sector is going faster than others. I do think that there's excellent work being done all over the world. Obviously the um, DeepMind, which Google bought, was based in London, which, uh, and so that's certainly has been one of the centers, but there's great academic research being done all over the world that is getting commercialized. And it's often getting commercialized in the context of open source projects. So one of those investments is called Coiled Computing. It right. commercializes this product called Dask, for, which is a tool for data scientists. But when it's an open source project, the people contributing to it are all over the world. The people using the product are all over the world. It's not like you say, oh, I hire a sales representative in Chicago and she's going to sell in Chicago and to hire to, to sell in Europe or in India or in Southeast Asia. I need to put a rep on the ground. Right. No, you just do thought leadership and make the code available. Yes. So these businesses, particularly open source ones, are global from the start. Yeah, that I agree. And you know, their the whole uh, uh, premise of such businesses is more B2B than B2C, uh, is what I have also realized, particularly for companies in data, companies in machine learning, AI. So uh, from that perspective, uh, do you feel that companies uh, or startups that are actually getting built in uh, deep tech, they need to look at fundamentally going deep into the market or do you think there is more opportunity for them to grow via acquisition or by actually partnering with a larger technology group and being able to provide their product over there so i mean you know as the number of companies in this area grows whether it's ai or machine learning or uh, data science how how do you see the opportunity paving out do you think there will be more acquisitions or there would be more individual startups who will go on and become much bigger My view on that has evolved. I think three or four years ago, I, I thought more of those capabilities were gonna come from the giants. And when I say the giants, I mean uh, Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud Platform, uh, you know, which are the major ones, you know, Microsoft and, and, and Azure as well. Those are logical places for it to happen. And, and certainly uh, companies like Facebook have been investing heavily in their machine learning infrastructure 
although they don't make it available to outsiders in, in quite the same way. And I think what's happening is that the pace of development and this, the, the evolving requirements are moving so fast that that energy is coming from startups. Right. And I think there will be, I think there will be uh, independent companies created. There are opportunities for uh, really substantial data management and machine learning management and data science management companies to be built that can be freestanding independent public companies. Yes. Now, some of them, there won't be 20 of them that'll be independent freestanding companies. There may be three or four that end up being the aggregators and tie those pieces together. Sure. And I mean, yeah, go on, go on. No, I, w I was also going to um, just add that I think outside of those categories in some of the things that we do, there are, uh, there, there are trends that I think are globalizing even faster. And so I, uh, we, you know, we talked about FinTech, the globalization of FinTech is, uh, and the, let, the rate of innovation of financial technology and it's unbundling, at least in the US and in probably in, in Europe as well, these services had all been built, but they were, they, they, in, they were built in the context of the big banks and the big insurance companies. And it's very painful to work with them. And so what's happening is that in the developed markets, the profitable services and lines of business are being take, you know, basically created outside of the banks with better user experience and uh, faster service. And in emerging markets, of course, many of these services are being created for the first time. And there is, and that is a real enabler of the economy. And so I do think that that's one of the exciting trends that we see with challenger banks and startup insurance companies and the like delivering capabilities to a broad audience all over the world. Sure. So, you know, you're essentially an early stage investor, uh, Greg. You know, so I, I feel that from particularly from your lenses, understanding the founder and what is his larger vision is very important. So what are, let me ask you this, what are the four or five things, the qualities that you see in the early stage founder that you really sort of say bang on, you know, this is the guy to put money behind and his idea and him together would be a great success. So what would be those four or five qualities yeah. that we look at? I think the you know, this is, of course, a, a subject of eternal debate, but I can tell you what I have found uh, and that has worked really well for me is uh, first, they have to have incredible knowledge of their domain and a curiosity about it and a desire to learn more and to dig deeper. But they, they really have to come in, you know, for me, I don't want somebody who comes in and paints a big vision. I want someone who can drill down and tell me the nuances and the design choices and why they've made them. So that's one. The second is have to have incredible drive. It often gets talked about as passion and I think that's a misnomer. I think what people need is drive because it's gonna be hard and you just gotta be able to keep going. Uh, and that, that means literally just a source of energy that will keep you going day, night, weekend. Uh, tenacity. The, uh, there'll be moments that are dark. There'll be moments where you ran an experiment and it didn't work and it's not quite clear what the answer is. Four, intellectual honesty. Hmm. I think people who try to convince themselves that things are true are really dangerous. So I want someone who's, who is actually looking at the facts. And five, judgment. That's the thing that uh, a CEO is gonna make a hundred decisions in between board meetings, That's right? True. And so, you know, the reality is, look, I'm a support, I'm a coach, I'm a mentor, but I'm not there. And so that level of business and personal judgment is just incredibly important. Sure, no, I think those are some great points. And uh, it, and you know, but uh, let me also ask you this, since you mentioned these areas, today you have so many portfolio companies and all those founders in some way are, I, I mean, for while the, the pandemic has not hit the, uh, the, 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 the digital companies in a big way, probably, you know, the physical companies have been more hit by the pandemic. But nevertheless, I think 
you know, in a business environment like this, everybody is hit to a large or small extent. So what is it that you're telling the founders? I mean, while you brought all the founders on board with all these five qualities, nevertheless, what is it that uh, you're telling them today, you know, to optimize their businesses? What is it that they need to sort of do to stay afloat when they're probably not being able to find customers, when they're not being able to maybe even deliver in markets, um, you know, which are outside their home markets. So how is it that you write yeah. your yeah. portfolio? I mean, we, uh, so I spent all of March and April, you, you know, March, April, and you know, the early part of May, this is all we were doing, right? We just were focusing on the existing portfolio and dealing, you know, helping people deal with the challenges. And I, I think the, you know, the, um, the, the first thing is you can't run out of money, right? It, you know, the, the reason businesses die is because they run out of money. Right. And that means, um, so th th that's, that's thing number one, you know, you just got to look at expenses in, and, so, and unfortunately, and that, that includes personnel expenses. And so almost everybody did some form of furloughs, some, you know, some temporary salary reductions, sometimes uh, reductions in force or layoffs. Uh, and any non-essential spending just stopped. So that's one. Uh, the second part of that is for many companies, we, you know, this is the benefit of having a long-term institutional backer. We letter catalyzed 13 financings in the first four months of the year. Oh, okay. To try, right? To, so you basically both try to reduce expenses and you just lay a little bit more track, right? This, the, the, Second is take care of customers, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll, well, I'll, I'll say, I'll generalize it. Take care of your people, but yeah. that's two fronts, right? One of which is take care of your customers because hold on to your existing customers is always the most efficient thing to do, right? right? You can't, uh, so, and that, but then you also have to take care of your people, right? The pe people that stay, you got to figure out how to support them, how to take care of their physical health, how to take care of their mental health, understanding that people are dealing with a very challenging environment. And then the third is focus. If people had three things that they were going to do this year, cut it back to one. Yeah. Right. Be really clear about a whole bunch of things that you're not going to do. And, uh, and you know, the consequence of that is that, you know, on March 7th, which is when we went into lockdown here, we didn't know all the answers. And yeah. so, but we said, okay, you're right. Don't run out of money, plan and replan, take care of your people, focus. And we went through about two or three rounds with every single company. So that by about April 15th, you could wake up and say, okay, okay. I think we got our feet on the ground. I think we know what we're doing. We got a plan and um, it's all working pretty well. Sure. Yeah. And I mean, you know, um, so let me ask you this way that, uh, I mean, you know, the plans of lots of companies who are there in your portfolio or otherwise, you know, out there uh, at large might have stalled for some time, you know, whether it was plans for them to uh, go global or to think or get into a new market or whatever. And uh, secondly, I feel that talent is very important uh, in technology companies. And you said that, you know, people, um, obviously, you know, the business climate was such where we even uh, the best of companies had to either ask some of their, put you as you said, furloughs or people were asked to uh, take a reduced cuts or even leave maybe in some places. So how is it that companies will manage when it comes to talent? Do you think uh, this uh, distant working or remote working culture is here to stay? And how can we make the most of it? I mean, you know. Uh, the best efficiencies, the best optimization can be done within these cultures so that, you know, eventually maybe this just becomes the way things work or the way um, uh, life happens or companies grow. Do you, do you see that happening? The, um, you know, yes, I think it has been trying for everybody. On the other hand, I think it's also the case that all the employees who are recognize how much wreckage there is in the US economy and the global economy are also more thankful to have 
jobs and good employers than they've ever had. That's been particularly true as we've been living in this, you know, again, highly competitive labor market here, the, the yes. war for talent. And, um, but, you know, we, we, we have a portfolio company called Beyond HQ, which actually helps people manage uh, remote locations. And we invested in that about 18 months ago because we could see it coming. It was already the case that you couldn't pack more people into the Bay Area. You couldn't hire every single engineer that you wanted. Yes. You know, within 10 miles of your office, you just can't do it anymore. And so I think this, I do think that this is going to be, if you think about the changes, let's just say go two or three years out at a time when we have a vaccine and a time when we're healing. When we look back, I think one of the biggest changes in the economy is going to be the acceptance of uh, remote work for every white collar job. Yes. And I think it is, it takes different things to manage. What it, to me, the big insight was that people struggled when they're pick a number, 50, 100, 200 people, and they're all coming to one office every day to set up a second location because it re really changed the work practices to try to keep people connected and in touch and the like. And it, it didn't always work very well. But when the flip th that switched is that everybody's remote. And when everybody's remote, it changes the culture. It doesn't happen at the proverbial water cooler. It's written down and it happens in Slack. It happens in collaboration within the workflow. Otherwise I, it doesn't happen. Yes. And so the business processes have just flipped. Yeah, that's true. But I also feel that, you know, the founder, when you probably chose him to make an investment, you never looked at him as a quality to be able to manage a remote team. Uh, you know, it was never there uh, as a quality which might have been seen by an investor. Now, how are you training the founders to be able to do that? What, what is it? How do they upskill themselves today to, you know, manage yeah. a team which is pretty much spread everywhere? And, you know, I was talking to the CEO of Virgin Hyperloop uh, the other day, and he made a very good point. He says, you know, we are in, I mean, in some place, some ways we are in some hardware business. So unless we're all sitting together, it becomes hard to put everything uh, together. So, you know, sometimes you have to be sitting in one place and the minds have to be together in order to maximize whatever output you are looking at. So now the founder never, the founder was never trained for that. So how, how does he change himself fast or her fast? Or, or, or her, exactly. I think the, um, you know, one of the things that I didn't include in the, in the list of five things wrongly, I got, uh, is this idea of a, of a growth mindset and a desire to always be learning and building new skills. Because in part, a founder of an early stage company is almost never ready to run the company when it's $10 million or $100 million. Right. They've got to grow and stretch themselves to do it. And so this is a moment of forced learning. And people, the, actually, I think, a lot of people can come go through the transformation and come out the other side with this new set of skills, but it takes work, right? And it takes struggle and it takes experimentation. So we're, we're fortunate to have a, uh, at our firm at Costa Noa, we've got an operating team, right? So we've got uh, three full-time partners in marketing, sales, and talent who, um, you know, amongst them, they probably run 20 learning labs a year. Now those all used to be physical. We used to host them in our office. Absolutely. And now of course they're principally virtual. But over this last four months, much of that has been around uh, managing in crisis, around transition into remote work, uh, around maintaining, building and maintaining cultures in environments where nobody sees each other. And so, uh, by the way, I think it's uh, the 55 companies that I know well, I'm amazed at the transformation. And sure. it's mainly going very, very well. Sure. Um, Greg, we're getting some questions also. So I'm going to probably ask uh, Murali 
Bhardwaz to uh, maybe ask his question first. He's in fact put about a couple of questions and then Anupriya Roy. Can we please then have them on the screen? Yeah. Go ahead, please. Uh, very nice uh, points that you have elucidated. So uh, my question number one is, uh, should the startup need to be revenue positive for uh, a angel or a VC to invest? What is your criteria? The, the, um, should it already have revenue? Suppose we are product ready and uh, concept ready, very uh, bullish about uh, generating the revenue down the line. Um, we are only product ready. Still, uh, is it a good time to go to the VC to showcase to, uh, based on the projections to raise the money or uh, you, you think that people invest money only when we are revenue positive? Well, so I can only speak to ourselves and I can, and obviously the, the majority of our companies are in, in, the, in the US and those that aren't have, are, have been Canada and Australia and Switzerland so far. Um, the, I, in general, so we do invest as early as company formation. So sometimes in products that haven't been built. Now those are rare cases. There are cases where often we know founders or it's a problem that we've studied and we know very well. One of the things that we pride ourselves on is being willing to go sometimes do customer discovery with founders so that we learn together what the requirements are. And we can figure out how big a problem is before customers are always using the product. Now that said, there is no doubt that it is easier to raise money when you're already generating revenue. When you've got referenceable customers who will say what they're using the product for and how good it is and how much money it saves them. So I would say the, you know, the, the most important thing is to have done that customer research, right? Not built it for yourself sitting in a lab. And, uh, and then it's possible to go share some of that research with investors and say, this is why we built it this way. And this is why we think there's lots of demand that'll help. But I think having a handful of customers using it will be even better. So yeah, I think there, are, there are some products for which uh, it is difficult to build the revenue. For example, WhatsApp, like uh, social networking uh, um, products, uh, the traction, revenue traction is difficult, but uh, the user traction can be achieved. So does a VC equally respect uh, a user traction uh, synonymous as equally good as revenue traction? Uh, so it depends on the VC and it depends on the market. So there, I think for the most part, early stage consumer VCs don't have a choice, right? They have to be willing to invest in traction that they hope will be monetized someday. Uh, on the other hand, I, I do, we don't fundamentally invest in consumer businesses. We principally invest in, in uh, business to business in environments and, you know, exceptions have been in, in education technology and, and, and FinTech. So for example, we led the series A at Springboard, which uh, is career transformation, particularly for people in data science and in UI UX design. It has a significant India footprint, again, both on the go to market side and on the product development side. But it did, in that case, it did already have revenue. So I think, uh, I think user traction is, uh, can be really impactful. In our world, the place where we see user traction but are still a question about what the path to monetization looks like is principally in and around these open source businesses. And that is the way a ton of software infrastructure is being built these days is in open source. And it has some of those very same dynamics. Thanks for your questions. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, can we have Anupriya online, please? Yeah. So I have this question that in the initial uh, steps, how... I think... Uh, 
we've probably lost her signal. So it says in the initial steps of the business, how do you keep note of for reaching larger targeted audience? Anu, can you unmute and ask your question, please? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, you can. Go ahead. Yeah, so I have this question that in the initial steps of the business, what should we keep keep in mind to, uh, to reach a larger based audience, our targeted customers? Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for your question. And it can be slightly different in different markets, but I would say in reaching a, um, a large audience and a broader set of customers, certainly one of the things to do is to begin and build thought leadership in your category. And it certainly is the case that blogging and content marketing and social distribution of that can be very impactful in uh, building a distribution channel. And you may not yet have the product to roll out through that distribution channel, but that certainly is uh, a significant way to start. In fact, um, this evening, I, I talked about these tools for data science and I was watching a, uh, and, and people, uh, Coil Computing is one of our uh, companies and they have uh, two of the, you know, the founder and their head of marketing. And they decided that the best format for them was to do a YouTube channel and for the two of them to lead people through capabilities and, of, of product and to banter back and forth. And it's a little bit like uh, the way my son watches Twitch. So what part of what's interesting to me is you can innovate around the formats and the formats where you're likely to find your audience and where you can really showcase what you know and the capabilities of product. Sure. You know, uh, let me ask you yeah, this. Thank question. you for your answer. Thanks, Anu. Um, you know, now if you're investing in a newer market, let's say in a market like India, you've largely been investing in Bay Area and in the US, uh, where you typically uh, looked at. But, you know, if you, let's say, find some, something interesting happening in deep tech in India or in somewhere in Asia Pacific, how is it that you will judge? I mean, and considering that right now we're all sitting so distantly and not even being able to meet each other, only virtually perhaps. How are you going to judge a founder? How are you going to make your decision as an investor? And I mean, do you, would you say that, okay, if it's come from a recommendation from an angel investment group and therefore it becomes a better choice for you to make investments? And I mean, so how do you, uh, and I mean, in India, you know, there might be a lot happening in this space at this point of time with Geo having raised so much big investment. There's going to be a whole big movement or a revolution that will take place in deep tech India and already see a lot of young startups working or doing a lot of work with Geo as a customer base in mind. So how as, as a founder uh, in early stage tech companies, are you going to make a decision to invest in a startup based in India or Asia? Well, I think the, yeah, and it's very hard. So uh, we, we have made uh, investment decisions where uh, that, that have been done completely in the COVID era. We have made investment decisions in one founder that we have never met face to face in the COVID era. And I think that actually teaches a fair amount about how to do that in remote geographies. So in prior cases, in all of the cases that uh, are, are international examples, we've, uh, those are uh, markets where we have co-investors and we, you know, we know people that we can triangulate with and we have met the founders. Often they've flown to us for the, you know, to do a Silicon Valley tour, but at some point we've gone to them before investing. But I think we, we, we have learned to do a fair amount of that evaluation of a person right. in, in these Zoom conversations. And it, you know, it is, uh, so we try to use sort of universal standards to do that. I think the other thing that I'll note is that a great many businesses, uh, th this isn't true at company formation, but in businesses where you've gotten going, I mean, the honest answer is 
you know, you push stuff to GitHub and we can evaluate what's in GitHub. We can evaluate the traction in adoption of the, of the product. You start selling stuff to customers and you, you, um, and, you know, you push the data directly out of what you're probably using as, you know, is, you know, QuickBooks at that time or zero. Okay. You, uh, so the availability of the, um, you know, so we want to see revenue growth. We want to see customer acquisition. We want to see customers renewing. And so in relatively early stage businesses, and there, you know, there have been some extraordinary ones that came out of, um, you know, geographies that aren't very close to Silicon Valley, where people just ship product and sign customers and renewed customers and expanded customers, and it's all in the data. And, right. you, you know, so it's hard to make that kind of decision in a three week investment cycle. But boy, you get to watch that over six months, where mm -hmm. people say this is our plan, and this is what we're going to do. And then you can see the atomic data there, that's plenty. Sure. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you on that. We've got another question um, uh, from a person who says, what is your take on the edutech sector? Because we've seen edtech rising uh, in the pandemic across the world and online learning becoming the way to go. So what, how do you see the scope of the sector expanding in the- Yes, we, um, I think the, the cause of digital education has been advanced a decade in about three months. I agree. And, and I say that, by the way, I'm quoting my younger sister who works at Coursera, uh, who is among the experts in the, in, in the category. Uh, and we have, you know, so we've made four venture investments uh, in, in the education sector. Um, two of them are companies that we've already sold, one to Cornerstone On Demand, one to, uh, to uh, a private equity buyer. Uh, Springboard and Quizlet are two you know, are two beneficiaries of this environment. You know, Quizlet is the world's favorite tool for building foundational knowledge and the everyone is remote all the time has accelerated its, uh, you know, it was born in the US, actually started by a sophomore in high school at Berkeley High School trying to learn vocab for his French lessons. Right. 12 years ago. And, uh, and so it's got its strongest growth here and it's, it's really helped expand globally. Right. I talked about Springboard already. Right now is the time when people know they need to transform their careers into digital careers. Absolutely. And so the, and doing it in six weeks uh, instead of taking a year or two years of graduate school to get a master's degree in data science is faster, it's more efficient, it's less expensive, it works as well. People, you know, the, the payback is immediate. It comes with a job guarantee. So these things have been swept up. And to me, the, um, those are the, uh, those are the, the, I'll call it the professional education and the career development uh, is frankly, mainly going to happen in the context of uh, of these new ed tech sectors, right? That, that you know, you're not going to build professional skills by going to a traditional university. Now, the question of um, how universities get transformed and um, how uh, I think is a tougher one. There's a whole, and I think it'll be different in different geographies. I think the U.S. might experience more disruption than international yeah. markets because we've had we've tied a bunch of stuff, including socialization and on, you know, on campus living and sports and a bunch of other stuff in the university environment that isn't all tied together in a market like India or Australia or the UK. Or, uh, and I think the question, but I, you know, K through 12 is really hard. There are some firms that have done a really good job with tools that they sell into K through 12 environments. Right. But I think the, um, we all know that the, you know, the under 10 year olds trying to study on Zoom isn't working that great. Yeah, it's right. It just isn't working that great. That's and true. that's just a matter of mental and psychological development. Yeah. And, I mean, I have, 
kids in that age and I can tell you their learning's been hampered. Yeah. So I think the question of, um, and, and, and as we talked about in the context of companies, hybrid is really hard. The yeah. idea that, oh, I've got a class of 20 kids and 10 of them are gonna be at home and 10 of them are gonna be in the classroom, but I'm still, we know from business meetings that are in that hybrid environment, it doesn't work as well. You're better off all being remote or all being in one place. So there's, um, I think there is, there's a lot of transformation coming for that sector. It's coming very fast. And I am really excited about the set of things that we can do for adults in professional education. That's the thing that I absolutely know and that I know we can invest in and I know we can build really profitable businesses that serve people well, that deliver extraordinary value. Correct. And do you think uh, somewhere, particularly you mentioned in higher education or probably skill learning uh, education or education technology, do you think it's going to be linked to jobs at some point of time? So if I'm taking, let's say, a course from Coursera, as a, as a student, I might be expecting that I might, it might give me some job prospects. So from universities, while every good university was built because they were able to, some good universities were able to promise the best of jobs coming from their campuses. Do you think that expectation would continue to stay when it comes to online, uh, let's say, uh, learning environments or startups which are giving these courses? Absolutely, absolutely. I think the question of, you know, you know I, I mentioned this only briefly, but Spring, Springboard comes with a job guarantee. They will literally return your money if you don't get a job. So they have to be meeting the needs of employers and helping connect people to employers. Otherwise yeah. the business won't work. And I think that is the future. I think that that is the way that it's gonna work. And it is a, you know, I think that partly is the way that the people in that education space are, you know, part of their market is the employer. Right. And so they need to be adaptive to the skills required and the places where there are job openings. And part of their market is the, you know, particularly in these professional education this, for, for the students, you know, we, in product management, we used to talk about what's the job to be done, right? For a student trying to transform her career in data science, the job to be done is to build a foundational set of school skills, get, get a recognized degree or certificate that validates that. Right. And get a job. Sure. Absolutely. And without the third one, you haven't completed the job. Yeah, that's true. So that's, that's going to be more important. And I think what you said about universities getting disrupted, that's where the disruption is really going to start from because which campus is going to ensure your better job will actually take all the good students away. Yes. Yes. And I, you know, and it is, you know, it is 10 times more expensive to be physically on, on campus, right? To change location, to go to a different city, to live in the dorms or get an apartment. And by the way, I think those universities, they do an extraordinary job. Yeah, the question to me is, I hate saying it this way, but does that become a luxury good? <laughs> right? Yes. And it might. I think, I mean, it's really important that we do a great job edu educating everybody. And yes. certainly that everybody who is, has the motivation, right? So reducing the price points increases access, right? We want access for everybody. We want it to be financially accessible. And, and, and that's frankly just world positive. And um, the existing universities, they do extraordinary work. But they, in the US, they're ungodly expensive and the price goes up 7% a year. Even when inflation is two or 3% a year. And it's unsustainable. Yes. I totally agree with you. Okay, we'll take one final question from one of our guests, Aman Mankani, if we can have him online, please. Okay, let me ask his question, uh, Greg. It says that what trend are you, what trend is being observed by international investors in India? Today, if, what are the sectors that are best to invest? at this time in which to avoid, okay, I think he's an investor. <laughs> yeah, well, I think that the, 
single biggest you, to, to me there are there are there are two answers to that and in in you know you're an expert on india and aman is an expert on india and i'm not going to purport to be the investor in, in india but i do think that the uh there are many things that are hard you, um moving products around is hard right getting groceries into people's hands is hard but uh, enabling financial products that are universally available and into the hands of uh, especially the, the emerging middle class, but broad, you know, but, but broader over time. And I think that actually uh, removing the friction from those right. is an extraordinary opportunity and it is good for the economy and it improves people's lives and uh, gives them access in ways that they haven't had. So that, that's certainly one. I think it's also right to say that the, I mean, there's been this obvious rapid expansion of mobile phones and connectivity over the last decade in India. And, and with all of this money coming in to Geo, I think the idea of the mobile platform. Yes. And all of the things that ride on a mobile platform, some of which of course will be financial products and payments, some of which will be, um, some of which will be gaming environments, some of which like our company Amplify does, will be taking existing brands and media and e-commerce companies and helping them acquire customers and engage customers in and around that environment. And so to me, those are the two things that I would be focused on. Sure. So I think um, I will not take more so questions here. While there is one question uh, is that how do you see social entrepreneurship changing now post the pandemic? Do you think it's going to become more important impact funding or do you think there are going to be different rules to it? Somebody sent it over Facebook. Yes, uh, I think social entrepreneurship has been building for 20 years. Ooh. And so when I was in graduate school, uh, five friends and I started a microenterprise program in a relatively uh, poor community in our neighborhood called East Palo Alto uh, in, in our area uh, based on what had been done at Grameen Bank in Bangladesh. And, you know, it was social entrepreneurship was a relatively modest effort at that time. And the people really want to be driven by mission. And there are sometimes a Quizlet, a springboard, Aquabyte, AI for fish farming, where you can be truly mission driven. Yes. Right? In a, in a fully commercial environment. And there are times where it requires social entrepreneurship. And we've seen all over the world, people do absolutely extraordinary things by dedicating their lives to social entrepreneurship, some of which are nonprofits, some of which are, I'll call it for-profit businesses, but not meant to be terribly profitable, just meant to pay for themselves that way. Right. And I think it speaks to a deep need in humans to be attached to their values and what they care about and in a world with, um, look, the, the, um, the harder it gets, and that's because of pandemic and it's because of international relations and it's because of uh, chaotic leadership, including um, chaotic leadership in our country. I think people, it drives people to want to make a difference and to want to be world positive. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll see more social entrepreneurship in this environment. Well, uh, thank you very much, Greg, for talking to us. I think this was a wonderful conversation and uh, so much to learn from you. One of our editors has actually asked one question from you and she's saying that, you know, as a tech investor, how do you judge qualities like tenacity and honesty in a founder? So we'll probably close it at that. It's a we'll close on that. I think the, uh, there are a couple of things that are really important. One of which is you have multiple conversations in multiple different venues. We used to do things like this over lunch and dinner and the like in different situations. And you, you know, on some level, I'd say face to face, you just probe, right? You, you know, you, you, you drill, it's like little, drill little wells and little moments of insight. And to some extent, it's seeing if those pieces connect with each other, right? Do they all tell the same story? or does one point in one direction and one point in the other direction, at which point I walk the other way. The other, I'll just have to say, and this is the thing that makes investing farther from home harder, 
is I half trust my eyes, but I do reference calls. And you, I just have to talk to references. And it's better if they're references from people that I know, but they don't have to be. And, I'm gonna, and I'll ask really direct questions. And I'll, I'll wanna do a half dozen of them. Because people can take something that they botched up badly and tell a great story about how they came out on top. And sometimes you can detect that by talking face to face, but you have to look around the back by talking yeah. to references as well. You got to do both. Sure. So thank you once again, Greg. It was wonderful talking to you. And uh, for all our attendees who have questions, uh, still have questions, please keep on posting them on Facebook Live. I'm going to ask Greg to answer them at some point of time in the coming days. But thank you indeed. I think it was a great learning uh, uh, you know, for the entire country who's going to see this video, and particularly for tech founders who today have a great ambition great ideas but really sometimes you know there is there is they are high on tech and slow on business and sometimes they are high on business and slow on tech and all these things need to combine together to make a great company and you know it's people like and folks like you who really make this possible and make it happen so thank you for taking out the time and talking to us and uh, hopefully the next time we'll probably do something like this we'll do it more in person <laughs> and getting to know each other better instead of Thank you. Once. I would look forward to it. Thanks so much for having me. I enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Bill.